This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, go to LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain, Chapter Twenty Four Splendid Days and Fearsome Nights. Tom was a glittering hero once more, the pet of the old, the envy of the young. His name even went into immortal print, for the village paper magnified him. There were some that believed he would be president yet if he escaped hanging. As usual, the fickle, unreasoning world took Muff Potter to its bosom and fondled him as lavishly as it had abused him before. But that sort of conduct is to the world's credit, therefore it is not well to find fault with it. Tom's days were days of splendor and exaltation to him, but his nights were seasons of horror. Injun Joe infested all his dreams, and always with doom in his eye. Hardly any temptation could persuade the boy to stir abroad after nightfall. Poor Huck was in the same state of wretchedness and terror, for Tom had told the whole story to the lawyer the night before the great day of the trial, and Huck was sore afraid that his share in the business might leak out yet, notwithstanding Injun Joe's flight had saved him the suffering of testifying in court. The poor fellow had got the attorney to promise secrecy, but what of that, since Tom's harassed conscience had managed to drive him to the lawyer's house by night and wring a dread tale from lips that had been sealed with the dismalest and most formidable of oaths, Huck's confidence in the human race was well-nigh obliterated. Daily Muff Potter's gratitude made Tom glad he had spoken, but nightly he wished he had sealed up his tongue. Half the time Tom was afraid Injun Joe would never be captured, the other half he was afraid he would be. He felt sure he never could draw a safe breath again until that man was dead and he had seen the corpse. Rewards had been offered, the country had been scoured, but no Injun Joe was found. One of those omniscient and awe-inspiring marvels, a detective, came up from St. Louis, moused around, shook his head, looked wise, and made that sort of astounding success which members of the craft usually achieve. That is to say, he found a clue. But you can't hang a clue for murder, and so after that detective had got through and gone home, Tom felt just as insecure as he was before. The slow days drifted on, and each left behind it a slightly lightened weight of apprehension. End of chapter 24 Chapter 25 Seeking the Buried Treasure There comes a time in every rightly constructed boy's life when he has a raging desire to go somewhere and dig for hidden treasure. This desire suddenly came upon Tom one day. He sallied out to find Joe Harper, but failed of success. Next he sought Ben Rogers. He had gone fishing. Presently he stumbled upon Huck Finn, the red-handed. Huck would answer. Tom took him to a private place and opened the matter to him confidentially. Huck was willing. Huck was always willing to take a hand in any enterprise that offered entertainment and required no capital, for he had a troublesome superabundance of that sort of time, which is not money. "'Where'll we dig?' said Huck. "'Oh, most anywhere.' Why, is it hid all round? No, indeed, it ain't. It's hid in mighty particular places, Huck, sometimes on islands, sometimes in rotten chests under the end of a limb of an old dead tree, just where the shadow falls at midnight, but mostly under the floor in haunted houses. Who hides it? Why, robbers, of course. Who'd you reckon? Sunday school superintendents? I don't know. If twas mine, I wouldn't hide it. I'd spend it and have a good time. Well, so would I. But robbers don't do that way. They always hide it and leave it there. Don't they come after it any more? No, they think they will, but they generally forget the marks, or else they die. Anyway, it lays there a long time and gets rusty, and by and by somebody finds an old yellow paper that tells how to find the marks, a paper that's got to be ciphered over about a week, because it's mostly signs and hieroglyphics. Hiero which? Hieroglyphics pictures and things, you know, that don't seem to mean anything. Have you got one of them papers, Tom? No. Well, then, how are you going to find the marks? I don't want to find any marks. They always bury it under a haunted house, or on an island, or under a dead tree that's got one limb sticking out. Well, we've tried Jackson's Island a little, and 
We can try it again some time. And there's the old haunted house up the still house branch. And there's lots of dead limb trees, dead loads of them. Is it under all of them? How you talk? No! Then how are you going to know which one to go for? Go for all of them. Why, Tom, it'll take all summer. Well, what of that? Suppose you find a brass pot with a hundred dollars in it, all rusty and gay, or a rotten chest full of diamonds. How's that? Huck's eyes glowed. That's bully. Plenty bully enough for me. Just you give me the hundred dollars, and I don't want no diamonds. All right. But I bet you I ain't going to throw off on diamonds. Some of them's worth twenty dollars apiece. There ain't any hardly but's worth six bits or a dollar. No. Is that so? Certainly. Anybody will tell you so. Ain't you ever seen one, Huck? Not as I remember. Oh, kings have slathers of them. Well, I don't know no kings, Tom. I reckon you don't. But if you was to go to Europe, you'd see a raft of them hopping around. Do they hop? Hop? Your granny. No! Well, what'd you say they did for? Shucks, I only meant you'd see em, not hopping, of course. What do they want to hop for? But I mean you'd just see em, scattered round, you know, in a kind of a general way. Like that old humpbacked Richard. Richard? What's his other name? He didn't have any other name. Kings don't have any but a given name. No? But they don't. Well, if they like it, Tom, all right. But I don't want to be a king and have only just a given name, like a nigger. But say, where are you going to dig first? Well, I don't know. Suppose we tackle that old dead limb tree on the hill to other side of Stillhouse Branch. I'm agreed. So they got a crippled pick and a shovel and set out on their three-mile tramp. They arrived hot and panting and threw themselves down in the shade of a neighboring elm to rest and have a smoke. I like this," said Tom. So do I. Say, Huck, if we find a treasure here, what are you going to do with your share? Well, I'll have pie and a glass of soda every day, and I'll go to every circus that comes along. I bet I'll have a gay time. Well, ain't you going to save any of it? Save it? What for? Why, so as to have something to live on by and by. Oh, that ain't any use. Pap would come back to this year town some day and get his claws on it if I didn't hurry up, and I tell you he'd clean it out pretty quick. What are you going to do with yourn, Tom? I'm going to buy a new drum, and a sure enough sword, and a red necktie and a bull pup, and get married. Married? That's it. Tom, you—why, well, you ain't in your right mind. Wait, you'll see. Well, that's the foolishest thing you could do. Look at Pap and my mother fight. Why, they used to fight all the time. I remember mighty well. That ain't anything. The girl I'm going to marry won't fight. Tom, I reckon they're all alike. They'll all comb a body. Now, you better think about this a while. I tell you, you better. What's the name of the gal? It ain't a gal at all. It's a girl. It's all the same, I reckon. Some says gal, some says girl. Both's right, like enough. Anyway, what's her name, Tom? I'll tell you sometime. Not now. All right, that'll do. Only if you get married, I'll be more lonesomer than ever. No, you won't. You'll come and live with me. Now, stir out of this, and we'll go to digging. They worked and sweated for half an hour. No result. They toiled another half hour. Still no result. Huck said, Do they always bury it as deep as this? Sometimes. Not always. Not generally. I reckon we haven't got the right place. So they chose a new spot and began again. Labor dragged a little, but still they made progress. They pegged away in silence for some time. Finally, Huck leaned on his shovel, swabbed the beaded drops from his brow with his sleeve, and said, "'Where are you going to dig next, after we get this one?' "'I reckon maybe we'll tackle the old tree that's over yonder on Cardiff Hill, back of the widow's. I reckon that'll be a good one. But won't the widow take it away from us, Tom? It's on her land. She take it away?' Maybe she'd like to try it once. Whoever finds one of these hid treasures, it belongs to him. It don't make any difference whose land it's on." That was satisfactory. The work went on. By and by, Huck said, "'Blame it, we must be in the wrong place again. What do you think?' "'It is mighty curious, Huck. I don't understand it. Sometimes witches interfere. I reckon maybe that's what's the trouble now. Shucks, witches ain't got no power in the daytime. Well, that's so. I didn't think of that. Oh, I know what the matter is. 
What a blamed lot of fools we are! You got to find out where the shadow of the limb falls at midnight, and that's where you dig. Then consound it! We fooled away all this work for nothing. Now, hang it all, we've got to come back in the night. It's an awful long way. Can you get out? I bet I will. We've got to do it tonight, too, because if somebody sees these holes, they'll know in a minute what's here, and they'll go for it. Well, I'll come around and mow tonight. All right. Let's hide the tools in the bushes. The boys were there that night about the appointed time. They sat in the shadow, waiting. It was a lonely place, and an hour made solemn by old traditions. Spirits whispered in the rustling leaves. Ghosts lurked in the murky nooks. The deep baying of a hound floated up out of the distance. An owl answered with his sepulchral note. The boys were subdued by these solemnities, and talked little. By and by they judged that twelve had come. They marked where the shadow fell, and began to dig. Their hopes commenced to rise. Their interests grew stronger, and their industry kept pace with it. The hole deepened, and still deepened. But every time their hearts jumped to hear the pick strike upon something, they only suffered a new disappointment. It was only a stone, or a chunk. At last Tom said, "'It ain't no use, Huck. We're wrong again.' "'Well, but we can't be wrong. We spotted the shatter to a dot.' I know it, but then there's another thing. What's that? Why, we only guessed at the time. Like enough it was too late or too early. Huck dropped his shovel. That's it, he said. That's the very trouble. We got to give this one up. We can't ever tell the right time. And besides, this kind of thing's too awful. Here this time of night with witches and ghosts a-fluttering around so. I feel as if something's behind me all the time, and I'm afeard to turn around, because maybe there's others in front a waiting for a chance. I've been creeping all over ever since I got here. Well, I've been pretty much so, too, Huck. They most always put in a dead man when they bury a treasure under a tree to look out for it. Lordy! Yes, they do. I've always heard that. Tom, I don't like to fool around much where there's dead people. A body's bound to get into trouble with them, sure. I don't like to stir him up, either. Suppose this one here was to stick his skull out and say something. Don't, Tom. It's awful. Well, it just is. Tuck, I, I don't feel comfortable a bit. Say, Tom, let's give this place up and try somewhere else. All right. I, I reckon we better. What'll it be? Tom considered a while, and then said, The haunted house. That's it. Blame it. I don't like haunted houses, Tom. Why, they're a dern sight worse than dead people. Dead people might talk, maybe, but they don't come sliding round in a shroud when you ain't noticing, and peep over your shoulder all of a sudden and grit their teeth the way a ghost does. I couldn't stand such a thing as that, Tom. Nobody could. Yes, but, Huck, ghosts don't travel around only at night. They won't hinder us from digging there in the daytime. Well, that's so. But you know mighty well people don't go about that handed house in the day nor the night. Well, that's mostly because they don't like to go where a man's been murdered, anyway. But nothing's ever been seen around that house except in the night. Just some blue lights slipping by the windows. No regular ghosts. Well, where you see one of them blue lights flickering around, Tom, you can bet there's a ghost mighty close behind it. It stands to reason, because you know that they don't anybody but ghosts use them. Yes, that's so. But anyway, they don't come around in the daytime. So what's the use of our being afeard? Well, all right. We'll tackle the haunted house, if you say so. But I reckon it's taken chances." They had started down the hill by this time. There, in the middle of the moonlit valley, below them stood the haunted house, utterly isolated, its fences gone long ago, rank weeds smothering the very doorsteps, the chimney crumpled to ruin, the window sashes vacant, a corner of the roof caved in. The boys gazed a while, half expecting to see a blue light flit past a window. Then, talking in a low tone, as befitted the time and the circumstances, they struck far off to the right, to give the haunted house a wide berth, and took their way homeward through the woods that adorned the rearward side of Cardiff Hill. End of chapter 25